The world is not always what it seems. Pull back the veil and you'll discover that sometimes it's much darker than you could possibly imagine. Since the beginning of human history, there have been stories about people coming face to face with entities and forces outside of our usual awareness. Some call them spirits, others demons, but whatever they are, they have the ability to put dread into the hearts of even the bravest of people. Even now, as we move into the 21st century, these frightening encounters continue. Unseen footsteps are heard, doors slam shut when no one is near them, objects move by themselves, and yes, sometimes, just sometimes, we come face to face with a terrifying apparition hell-bent on destroying us. Here are five paranormal encounters with the undead. The Hurricane Katrina Haunting during the events of Hurricane Katrina, there were many stories of brave nurses, doctors, paramedics, and more doing everything that they could. What those individuals saw in those days and weeks surrounding the disaster impacted them forever. But in the case of one medical worker, her volunteer work brought her face to face with the paranormal. She never shared her name, so we'll call her Bethany. After the waters of Hurricane Katrina began to recede from New Orleans and the surrounding areas, volunteers like Bethany were tasked with the grisliest of jobs. She wasn't just asked to find the stranded people who needed medical assistance, but instead, in fact, was asked to move from building to building and find the bodies of those who had drowned as the waters penetrated residential areas during the storm. Though terrible, the macabre task was an essential one, bringing closure for families who had lost loved ones. Although much of the water had receded, there was still enough on the ground that some areas could be only accessed by boat and then by trudging through it in wading boots. Bethany and other volunteers would wade through the murky water to a house and explore the darkened rooms inside to see if anyone could be found. Because bodies had usually been in water for some time, they began to decompose. The rotten smell was unlike anything Bethany had ever encountered before, and so she had to spread Vic's menthol ointment under her nose just to stop herself from vomiting at the stench. And if Bethany did find a body, she would not be the one to retrieve it. Instead, she would spray paint a large yellow X on the outside of the building, alerting revival crews to the presence of a body. Though each discovery was frightening and heartbreaking, there was one instance that has left Bethany shaken to her core to this day. She and her assigned partner, Jay, found an old house that was very run down. In fact, she described it as resembling a shack when she discovered it. As soon as she saw the building, a shiver ran down her spine. For some unknown reason, she knew that there was something very wrong about this particular place the moment she set her eyes on it. Despite her instincts telling her that she should turn around and leave the dilapidated house behind, Bethany had a job to do, and so she did it. She and Jay waded out to the building and then entered it slowly. As soon as she crossed the threshold to the darkness inside, she could smell it. There was a body rotting somewhere inside. Alongside this, however, there was also another smell. It smelled like earth and mold. Looking at her colleague Jay, Bethany could see that he was white as a sheet. He wasn't the type of person to be overwhelmed or nervous at doing that job, but he was looking clearly frightened. Looking around the hallway where they both stood, Bethany was shocked to see bones hanging from the ceiling. Although the bones didn't look human, they were tied up in a ritualistic fashion. Suddenly, Bethany remembered that voodoo is practiced in that part of the world. The hairs on her neck stood up, and she had goosebumps all over her body. Jay noticed the bones too, and that's when they found strange carvings etched in the walls of the house. Pulling their nerves together, Jay and Bethany continued forward in search of the origin of the rotting smell. Soon they entered a kitchen, and that is when they saw it. The body of an old lady was tied to an overhead beam. It was rotten and deceased, but nonetheless, its dead eyes seemed to stare at the two rescue volunteers, and the face had a wicked smile that exposed rotten teeth beneath, frozen in rigor mortis. Then from somewhere else in the house, a horrid cackling noise sounded. Something truly evil was nearby, and Jay and Bethany knew it. They rushed out of the house and marked it with a yellow X for the retrieval crew. 
After that day, Bethany and Jay never quite got over that experience. They both agreed that they had heard the cackling noise and whatever it was, was not human. Experiences of a crime scene cleaner. After leaving high school, Jack landed a job clearing fire and water damage from buildings. It was intensive work, but at first, Jack was happy just to have a full-time income. That happiness, however, was short-lived. His first assignment was to clean out a basement that had flooded with sewage. When the job was complete, Jack was called into his boss's office. He was told then and there that the company was putting together a specialized cleanup crew. This seemed surprising as he had only been with the company for a few days. Jack wondered why he had been selected for what was described to him as important work. He was shown a variety of equipment that he would use, including hazmat suits and dangerous cleaning chemicals. Still, the boss was vague about what Jack was going to be cleaning up. It finally became clear when he went to the job as part of a new cleanup crew. An elderly person had died inside a house and had been sitting in a chair and decomposed. Jack was unnerved by this, but he was given assurances that he would never actually have to see the body. That promise was broken immediately. When he arrived, the deceased was still there as a crime scene investigation team were prepared to move the body from the house. The body was so rotten that it had decomposed into pieces. Despite the hazmat suit, the smell of death was everywhere throughout the house. Once the coroner's team had removed the remains, Jack and his team had got to work. But that was when the strangeness began. Jack was instructed to disassemble the chair the deceased had been sitting on. He first removed the back of the chair, putting the pieces in a hazmat bag. All of this was done to stop any possible disease from spreading. As he moved away from the rest of the chair with the bag in hand, it began to slowly rock back and forth by itself. It was as if the deceased person was still there, moving around on the chair. Eventually, the rocking stopped, and Jack persuaded himself that there must have been a natural explanation for why it was moving on its own. He took the rest of the chair apart, but as he did so, he began to feel ill. Again, he easily persuaded himself that feeling nauseous under the circumstances was perfectly natural. Once the chair was removed, Jack turned his attention to the floor around the chair. It was heavily stained with rotten fluids from the body. He was instructed to pour cleaning chemicals over the spot and let it soak through the carpet to the floorboards underneath. Jack went out to the van to get the chemicals, but when he returned inside, he heard a noise coming from the basement. Three other members of the cleanup crew had been down there looking to assess what might have dripped through the floor as the person decomposed. But instead, they had seen something that terrified them. They scrambled up the stairs and ran out as if they were being chased, just as Jack was placing the bottle of chemicals next to the floor stain. When Jack caught up with them, the cleanup crew told him that someone was down in the basement. It had been difficult for them to see exactly who it was because it was so cluttered with boxes and other belongings, but someone was most definitely down there. Jack thought it was probably someone homeless sleeping down there. So he walked back over to the house and stood next to a small open window that looked into the basement at the base of the building. After waiting a few minutes and hearing nothing, Jack and one of the other workers decided to go inside and search the basement. With flashlights in hand, they slowly descended underneath the house into the darkness. No matter how hard they searched, however, they couldn't find anyone hiding down there. On the dusty floor, all that could be seen were the footprints of the cleanup crew themselves. Convinced the men who had ran out of the basement had just spooked themselves, Jack and his co-worker began to go up the stairs. And that is when they heard it. A horrible hacking cough right behind them. They turned and looked around again, but there was no sign of anyone down there. The only strange thing was that in one corner of the room, dust had been kicked up as if someone or something recently moved past there. Jack then called the rest of the crew back into the house and managed to convince them that everything was fine. So they continued with the job. However, when Jack returned to the spot where the chair had sat on the ground floor, the bottle of chemicals he had left there was gone. It had been moved across the room. Jack was convinced no one else had been in the room to move it. He then heard someone whisper something in his ear, the words damp and cold. 
They were indistinct, but the experience terrified him. The crew left the house soon after, but the story doesn't end there. That night, Jack had a horrifying nightmare where he was inside the house being chased through the rooms by the frightening figure of an old rotting corpse. It was angry, shouting at Jack to leave his house and the belongings alone. The next day, Jack spoke with his colleagues in the cleanup crew. They all had the exact same dream. Lost in the woods for eight hours. We often think about paranormal encounters in haunted houses, but what about the ancient woods of the world? Surely they contain more spirits than anywhere else. For a woman named Jane, the densely forested areas of rural central Virginia provided the setting for a chilling paranormal encounter. Jane was only 10 years old at the time. At that age, she would often spend time playing in and around the woods, sometimes by herself, sometimes with a friend. One day while exploring deer trails through the woods near where she lived, Jane and her friend Alice found a creek. It was a special place, quite different from the others Jane and Alice had found, and so they decided to play there. The creek was wide and deep enough to swim in. The water was clean and it was surrounded by comfortable mossy banks where the children could play and rest quite happily. After just a few hours of playing there, Jane and Alice decided that they would come back to the creek the next day. And so they intended on doing just that. At 1 p.m., they packed a picnic and headed back to their favorite new spot. They walked along the trail that they thought led to the creek. They were surrounded by looming trees and giant ferns, but they soon realized that they must have taken a wrong turn. Where they expected the creek to be there was a small clearing instead. They persuaded themselves that the creek must have been further along the path, so they continued. That was when Jane first noticed Alice behaving strangely. She began to act nervous as they headed deeper and deeper into the woods, looking behind over her shoulder several times, as if expecting to see something following them. After another 30 minutes or so of following the path, they made a bizarre discovery. On the floor of the forest was an entire bathroom laid out in front of them. There was a sink, toilet, and bathtub, and they were all overgrown with ivy and other plants. To lighten the mood, they joked about it being Bigfoot's bathroom as they continued along the path. When another hour passed without encountering any familiar sights, Jane and Alice began to grow worried. They now thought that they were lost, so they decided to give up on finding the creek and instead tried to go back the way that they came to leave the woods behind and go home. The two girls then had a disagreement about which direction was the way home. But the argument became so fierce and petty that they fell out and split up, storming off in opposite directions from each other. Jane headed the way she thought was best, but after about 10 minutes on her own, she started to hear footsteps behind her in the forest, as if she were being followed. Jane slowed down, thinking it was Alice wanting to catch up with her, but that's when Jane noticed the chilling truth. Whoever was following, they were matching Jane's pace exactly. If she stopped, their footsteps stopped. If she slowed down, they would slow down. If she sped up, so would they. This continued for some time and Jane began to doubt her own sanity as to whether there really was something following her nearby. She became so frightened that she picked up a piece of wood ready to swing it at her stalker if they decided to appear from the bushes or trees. After hours of walking, Jane's panic grew and suddenly a familiar sight came into view. It was the overgrown bath, sink, and toilet. She had walked in a giant circle for hours. Exhausted, Jane sat on a log and cried her heart out for being lost. That was when she heard someone walking up straight behind her. Jane shouted out Alice's name, hoping it was her friend. But when the footsteps began running towards her, Jane ran away from them as fast as she could. As she fled, the footsteps followed, and then something even stranger happened as the sun set. She began to hear church bells coming from inside the woods. The phantom church bell struck fear into her heart, and Jane then noticed a strange dark cloud directly over where she was in the woods. A gray mass swirled around it, and from the middle there appeared a giant vortex where the sound of bells were coming from. Jane felt sick just looking at it, and continued running until it grew so dark that she tripped over something on the ground. The fall knocked the wind out of her, but she realized that the footsteps and the bells were now gone, 
and the cloud above had vanished. Jane got to her feet and saw that she had tripped over an old fence post. She was then able to follow the fence until it led her out of the woods. When Jane got home, she was happy to learn that Alice had returned home after leaving the woods without incident, thinking Jane had done the same. But Jane did not have an uneventful experience. To this day, she sees herself as very lucky. If she hadn't found the fence post, whatever strange phenomenon she had awoken within the woods would have found her, and she believes no one would have ever heard from her again. The Frightening Encounter While Driving Home A man named Pete had a brush with the paranormal on July 4th, 2020, one that he's unlikely to ever forget. He lived in Northeast Ohio at the time, and had recently landed a job as a process technician at a dairy plant. The job paid well, and Pete was happy working from 4 p.m. until 4 a.m. every shift. The only difficulty was the commute. It was around 35 miles one way, and that was through country roads and remote routes. To try to cut down the commute time, Pete liked to drive through a large wooded area. Even at night and when fog was common, Pete didn't mind heading through the woods in the dark. He grew up in a wooded area, so he had no reason to fear that part of the world. In fact, he was very comfortable there. Every night, he would make the same journey. That was until July 4th. On that night, he was driving home through the pitch dark. The fog was there once more, shrouding his car and the trees in an eerie blanket of dread. This put Pete on edge a little more because he had to look out for deer and other animals that might rush out onto the road as he drove. To pass the time, Pete was listening to a podcast as the car continued slowly along the road, shaking its way through the woods. Just as he was thinking about what he would eat when he got home, he saw something up ahead off to the side of the road. His headlights caught something. Two eyes were staring back at him. He slowed the car and then, sure enough, a coyote came out of the trees. Pete had seen coyotes before, but this one left him feeling unsettled. There was something different about it, although it was difficult to make out all of its features in the fog. Pete slowed the car even more, moving at a snail's pace as the animal crossed the road. But then it did something alarming. It stopped moving. The coyote just sat in the middle of the road and stared at Pete. He had to stop the car just a few meters from the animal. The woods were silent around him, and there was no hint of another car on the road. He hadn't passed any, and so he didn't expect to either. It was rare for people to be on the road at that time of night. The animal continued just to stare at him, and it was making Pete increasingly uncomfortable, so he honked his horn. He expected to see the animal startled by this, but instead the animal now smiled back at him. Its mouth drew back, revealing large white teeth. But what frightened Pete was something that he'll never forget, which was the realization that was made in that moment. The coyote did not have the teeth of an animal. Instead, its teeth were that of a human being. A chill ran through Pete's body and his heart raced at the sight. Finally, the animal got up, still smiling its terrifying grin, and then ran off through the fog and back into the woods. Understandably, Pete did not hang around. He shoved his foot down on the gas and sped away, trying to put that stretch of road as far behind him as possible. All the way home, he thought about what he had seen. Then he remembered some of the old stories. The stories of strange spirits that roamed the woodlands. The native peoples who first lived in that region had a name for them, skinwalkers. Trickster spirits that were not animal or human, but something else entirely, sometimes playful, sometimes deadly. When Pete got home, he felt sick to his stomach, and when he retells the story now, he remembers that dog-like face with human teeth, and still entertains the possibility that he did encounter something ancient that walks the woods and can wear a human face. The house I rented is an evil portal. Many of us yearn for that one paranormal experience where we see a ghost or a cryptid, or experience some other form of unknown phenomenon. We all want to be able to tell that tale, but what if that experience is in your own home? The idea that the place where you live, a place that should be a sanctuary, can be infected by a supernatural force can be difficult to comprehend. What do you do when evil takes up residence in your home? That was the problem facing one man who wishes to remain anonymous. 
This man always wanted a place of his own. But the only one he could afford to rent was a trailer sitting on about five acres of land he got cheap. The property sat in a valley somewhere in the southwest of the US, but when monsoon season arrived, over half of the property would often end up underwater. The only way to access the piece of land was via an old dirt track that led to the nearest town about nine miles away. He was in a terrible place financially and was eventually able to strike a deal with the property owner. If he did some work on the property and took care of it, he wouldn't have to pay as much rent, if any. The trailer itself had been left to rust for many years. He decided that he would try to bring it back from the dead. When he first entered the trailer, he discovered that it was littered with other people's belongings. Previous tenants had left their things behind. Now, Tom had to dispose of them. After a lot of hard work, the trailer was at least livable. Except for one room at the back. Tom felt uneasy there, but couldn't explain why. So he simply avoided using that room for any purpose. Once the trailer was fixed up, he felt like celebrating. He invited over his friend to the property to stay for a while. At that time, a neighbor who lived in another trailer on the property came by with his family to help the man celebrate officially moving in. But that was when the real troubles began. When the neighbor realized he was locked out of his car, the man's friend agreed to drive him back to his trailer to get his spare keys. But on the way back, there was a huge boom that echoed across the property. As it turns out, a lightning bolt had exploded on the ground next to the car. If it was any closer, both of the men would have died. After that incident, the friend said he didn't want to stay at his trailer anymore. He made excuses and left, and their friendship soon withered after that. The man was perplexed, but he was happy at the trailer for a time, more or less. That was until the dreams began. He started having vivid dreams about the trailer at night. Voices would come to him, sending strange messages, and there was something horrid and slimy growing in the back of the room during his visions. A recurring part of his dreams were that snakes would appear en masse on his doorstep. Up until this point, he hadn't had any snakes on the property. But as his dreams grew more intense, he began to see more and more of them appearing around near his trailer. It frightened him so much, he had to get his neighbor to come over and dispose of them. He continued to hear voices from the dreams, but in his waking life. He heard people talking outside of his trailer, but he could never quite make out what they were saying. Finally, he left an audio recorder on while he slept one night. When he played it back, what he heard shocked him. Inside the cabin, there was someone talking a woman. She kept saying two words over and over, come home. Then she broke into a blood-curdling scream. At this point, he would have ran away from the trailer then and there, but due to his circumstances, he had nowhere else to go. Instead, he phoned a shaman to come and bless the property, hoping that he could exercise the evil forces so that he could finally live in peace. When the shaman arrived at the property, he was immediately drawn to the remnants of an old campsite. He looked at it and turned to the man saying, you shouldn't have done that, and he refused to go into any other details. The shaman left without entering the trailer or blessing it. But he now knew what he had done wrong. When he had cleaned out the trailer, he burned the belongings of those who had once lived there. That had angered some of those who apparently had died, but never left. He tried to stay longer, fighting for the life that he wanted, but when he started seeing a dark entity inside the trailer itself, he knew that supernatural forces were only going to get worse. He left the trailer behind for good. To this day, he states that those were the worst eight months of his life. He'll never forget that time when he angered the spirits so much that they almost drove him mad. Thank you so much for watching this video and don't forget to join my Discord and follow me on Twitch. Both are the first links in the description of this video. Be sure to join those now and I promise you, you'll love the community over there. It's a really good time. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.